I would intend to give you an overview of the next two and a half days, even if I could. What I'd like to do in the next 25 minutes is diffuse your skepticism. It's possible that the real skeptics didn't bother to show up, uh, but in the run-up to this conference, I heard a certain amount of grumbling. What an anachronistic topic. At this time and place, the world is being taken over by right-wing autocrats. Uh, the danger of nuclear war is increasing. The Einstein Forum has nothing better to do than twiddle its collective thumbs over old-fashioned concepts like truth and beauty. That was a moral objection. The conceptual one, made by a distinguished postmodernist friend of mine, was almost worse. Truth, she said, is now manufactured by technology, just as beauty is now manufactured by Hollywood. So if there's anything interesting to think about here, it's the way those concepts are constructed and why. Now, I could get off the hook pretty easily by saying this conference was not originally my idea. <laughs> Every year about this time, we hold the annual meeting of our board of advisors, and we couple the meeting uh, with a conference in order both to entertain and exploit them. Entertain. What better pleasure can we offer an extraordinary group of internationally distinguished features, thinkers but an intellectual feast? We feed them too, but within the limits of a hard-won budget. Uh, exploit, who better to put on stage than our extraordinary intellectually distinguished board members whose travel expenses have already been allotted under a separate subheading that doesn't tax our <clears throat> hard-won budget. And one of the things we do at each meeting is decide on a topic for the next year's conference. Last year, most of us were stumped. Choosing a topic seemed weightier than usual because we're celebrating, as most of you know, the Einstein Forum's 25th anniversary and which of all the questions and concepts we've treated deserve to be emblematic. Imagining solidarity might have been appropriate, but we'd already decided to do that last year. Late in our deliberations, one of our newer board members, Thomas Nauman, suggested we turn our attention to truth and beauty. Now, Thomas is a physicist, albeit one with a wider knowledge of history, literature, and religion than many natural scientists choose to show. Still, as I understand his primary focus in his own interest, and I'll talk about it tomorrow, it's the relation of truth to beauty in the natural world that many physicists find self-evident. For our patron saint, Albert Einstein, the truth, of its, the truth of the universe and its beauty were one and the same. Here's what he wrote about Mozart. Mozart's music is so pure and beautiful that I see it as a reflection of the inner beauty of the universe. Of course, like all great beauty, his music was pure simplicity. I actually went to a Mozart concert last weekend, partly uh, to help me think about these questions. Simplicity, not sure. Now, not every natural scientist marries truth and beauty as Einstein did, as we'll hear from another physicist tomorrow, Lisa Randall. And one might argue that Einstein's conviction that the truth of the universe must be beautiful blinded him from acknowledging the truths of quantum mechanics since they undermined the order and harmony that for Einstein were hallmarks of beauty. But for ordinary observers, the unity of truth and beauty is easiest to avow in the natural world. You needn't even contemplate the galaxies. I invite any skeptic to join me on a corner of the West Irish coast where I've taken to spending summers and stare for a few minutes at the points where sea, sky, and cliff come to play. Pictures don't do it justice, so I won't bother to show you any. There's just no way to look at that vista and doubt the truth of that beauty or the beauty of that truth. Indeed, when you're there, it seems more fundamentally true, as it were, than anything else in the world. If you're lucky and not averse to religious language, there are evenings when the light tears clouds so exactly you will think you see the hand of God just pointing, behold. Well, like most of us raised in the West, I have the first chapters. Oh, I forgot to. It's very important. I just want to show you some beauty. Um, almost all of these slides are just an attempt to show you some beauty here, some human-made beauty. Like most of us raised in the West, I have the first chapters of Genesis in my ear. 
God created light and saw it was good, kitov, you could translate, how good, and so on the story goes for the rest of creation. God gave us a world whose truth was good and beautiful, we fucked it up. You needn't be Christian or Jewish to find this view persuasive. Voltaire thought the only plausible part of the Bible was the doctrine of original sin. Still, even in the Anthropocene, and perhaps especially now, the difference between the beauty of the natural world and that of the human is as intuitive as the first day of springtime, be it in West Ireland or Manhattan. So I could tell my postmodernist friend that the topic was proposed by a physicist for whom the connections between truth and beauty are less fraught than they seem to those of us whose main subjects of inquiry lie in the natural world, but that would be wimpy. In fact, I seized on Thomas's proposal immediately just because it will seem anachronistic at this moment in time. I'm not gonna talk about truth, though others at this conference will, because I have nothing whatsoever to add to the millions of words already written on it, a few of them by me, um, either in philosophical journals or more lately by thousands of hapless newspaper articles seeking criteria to save us from what's been called a tr post-truth world. At the risk of sounding pig-headed, I've always liked Samuel Johnson's refutation of Barclay. Truth can be as simple as kicking a stone. And even its denier in chief, I suppose, would have to argue, uh, acknowledge the reality of a boulder. Anybody got one to throw in the right direction? I'm less worried about the disappearance of truth right now than the disappearance of beauty as a criterion in art, as a promise of happiness, as anything but a claim to be deconstructed. The impulse to dismiss or perhaps to flee from beauty is evident all over the art world. Just yesterday, the New York Times profiled an exhibit in Rotterdam consisting of four giant pieces of shit. It's an attitude that was recently responsible for a cultural political decision in Berlin that still has me gnashing my teeth. The city hired the brilliant Spanish choreographer Nacho Duado to run its ballet company and fired him long before his initial contract was up. The decision makers preferred the fashionably aesthetic, not aesthetic, aesthetic gyrations of modernist Sasha Waltz to Duato's sumptuous reinterpretations of classical dance. And thinking about what to do tonight, I actually considered for a while just talking about his nutcracker, which left me and my pretty cool 27-year daughter literally open-mouthed in wonder last Christmas. I know, the nutcracker. What could be a more anachronistic example with which to think about beauty? What stopped me was not the fear of snorts or raised eyebrows, but the fact that there is no internet footage of the Berlin production, nor were there any reviews. The critics had decided that Duato's work is kitsch and didn't bother to see his version of a, world, of a work they hold beneath contempt anyway. But I urge all of you, if you ever get a, a chance to see a production by Nacho Duato, do it immediately. Invited to riff on truth and beauty, two of our board members came up with near identical titles, Ugly Truths. Well, it was actually one was Ugly Truth and one was Ugly Truths. Due to the impending birth of a grandchild, Diana Pinto will not be giving her talk, but it's significant that both she and Philip wanted to go in similar directions. Because so many truths are so ugly, we cannot imagine a unity, much less an identity of truth and beauty. We've come so far from the platonic conviction that beauty can be a guide to truth that we're inclined to suspect the opposite. Uh, if it's beautiful, it can't be true. What's real are relations of power. Perhaps this is the thought, if there was one, behind the Viennese creators of the Rotterdam exhibit. We spend masses of energy creating exquisite cuisine that's enjoyed for a moment, and what remains for a long time is a pile of shit. Now, power, goes this view, may give off bits of fluff, the late Marx called it superstructure, that work like foam on a glass of beer. Delicate, oddly pleasant, but entirely irrelevant to quenching your thirst. The power in question is unbendingly material, never far from threats of violence. The power of beauty, by contrast, may be embedded in material, but when put up against violence, it looks as silly and retreats as quickly as Pepsi-Cola retreated from its ad campaign featuring Kendall Jenner and a can of soda. 
the language of power. I, for those of you who, who didn't know this little interview, I should say Kendall Jenner, one of the Kardashian family, uh, was um, in Pepsi's attempt to be, oh, I don't know, trendy, relevant, all that stuff, had a, a demonstration against racism that looked as if it were getting violent, and Kendall Jenner walked up and gave the cops a bottle, a can of Pepsi, and diffused all the trouble. Um, Pepsi pulled its ad after 24 hours. It was really a very silly commercial. But the view is that, the, uh, the, you know, except for Pepsi for 24 hours, the language of power and violence is ugly, but at least it's honest. Now, some will take the objections a step further. The problem with beauty is not that it isn't real in a way that power relations are real. The function of human-made beauty is to distract us from the ugly truths that are real. This is not, by the way, a postmodern thought. Its most compelling expression was written by Rousseau, who wrote in 1754 that all the arts and sciences do is weave garlands of flowers around the chains that bind us. The state would be naked and indefensible without culture, which intervenes to convince us to love our slavery by telling us that various forms of slavery are what civilization comes to. Without culture, the mechanisms of power would be open and obvious. With culture, we are blind to them. So the arts exist as decoration and diversion to distract us from the fact that we live in states devoted to greed and war. One response of the contemporary art world is to plaster the chains with shit or garbage to show that we live in a culture without taboo, when the real taboos sit so deep we can hardly see them. Rousseau's arguments are so good that when I first read them as a young assistant professor of philosophy, I swore I'd quit my job if I couldn't answer them. Uh, I did quit that job, but I'm still working in the humanities, <laughs> and I'm still struggling with them. Now, if Rousseau found something wrong in the production of beauty to disguise or at least to decorate the ugly truths about inequality and oppression that marked political structures in his day, it can seem barbaric in ours. That's the word Adorno used for anyone who tries to create beauty after Auschwitz. Uh, I won't pretend to have a definitive rebuttal to that claim, but I want to take it on by looking at two cases that may be unrelated by anything but than the fact that I love both of them. One is the thinker Jean Marie, best known for his essays on Auschwitz, but also the author of the most powerful defenses of the Enlightenment written in the 20th century. And the other is the artist Pierre Bonnard, who evokes more beauty on canvas than any painter I know. Now, even in Bonnard's day, beauty was at best a secondary criterion of value in the art world. That's not painting what he does, was Picasso's verdict on Bonnard's work. Uh, I really do try to avoid nostalgia, and I could have used more recent work, even in an art world where the judgment beautiful has been replaced at best by interesting. I have seen real beauty in some works of contemporary art, not many, but still. I chose Bonnard because it suddenly became clear to me that at the time he was painting his last gloriously radiant landscapes and still lives, Amory was a slave laborer at Auschwitz. It's just a historical coincidence. I don't, as I said, know anything that connects these two underappreciated giants, but the fact that I happen to love their work. The coincidence is painful. What in this case could truth and beauty have anything to say to each other? Amory's most famous work hits people like us where it hurts. The essay is translated into English as At the Mind's Limits, but the original title, An die Grenzen des Geistes, is much broader. Geist is somewhere between mind and spirit, a word that conveys the ability to cherish all the world's treasures that are not for sale. What lifts you, even for a moment, when a line of poetry or a phrase of melody or a glimpse of an artwork takes you above the rush and the muck of the ordinary? Everyone in this room will have felt its sudden startling power. It's why we do what we do. Knowing that it's evanescent doesn't stop us from chasing it. 
Jeanne Marie, born Hans Meyer to an innkeeper in an Austrian village, chased it as much as anyone and often caught it too. Though he never finished high school, his love of the life of the mind and as well as his sheer erudition shines on every page he wrote. I reckon I catch less than half of his illusions. At the mind's limits is a record of a broken heart. When the Nuremberg laws turned Amory into the Jew he wasn't raised to be, he fled Austria for Belgium where he joined the resistance. Arrested and tortured by the Gestapo, he was sent to Auschwitz in 1944. His reflections about the impotence of everything he loved, reason, spirit, the infinite beauty of, his, of words, when confronted with absolute evil are among the most harrowing in Holocaust literature. The essay mentions music, though not painting, but Amory's deepest passions were clearly verbal. He'd passed the time in the freezing Gur internment camp composing an anthology of German poetry from memory. He describes the attempt to recall the beauty that had served him there and elsewhere when a favorite line from Hölderlin came to mind as he returned from a work detail at Auschwitz. I'm going to quote a long and painful passage, and I have decided to leave you only with images of beauty um, while listening to it. <clears throat> I repeated the stanza somewhat louder, listened to the words sound, tried to track the rhythm, and expected the emotional and mental response that for years this Holdenin poem had awakened in me would emerge. But nothing happened. The poem no longer transcended reality. To reach out beyond concrete reality with words became for our ver before our very eyes a game that was not only worthless and an impermissible luxury, but also mocking and evil. Hourly, the physical world delivered proof that its insufferableness could only be coped with through means inherent in that world. In other words, nowhere else in the world did reality have as much effective power as in the camp. Nowhere else was reality so real. In no other place did the attempt to transcend it prove so hopeless and so shoddy. Where poetry and philosophy still meant something, they appeared trivial, and where they were not trivial, they no longer meant anything. We didn't require any semantic or logical syntax to realize this. A glance at the watchtowers, a sniff from the crematorium sufficed. In fact, he continued a remembered line of poetry brought at most pain or derision, then trickled away in a feeling of complete indifference. And he concludes that essay with a terrible thought. The word always dies where the claim of some reality is total. It died for us a long time ago, and we were not even left with the feeling that we must regret its departure. Now, if Adorno's aphorism about poetry after Auschwitz has meaning at all, it would seem to be exactly what Amory described, a game that was not only worthless, a worthless and impermissible luxury, but also mocking and evil. Yet Amory wrote that Adorno's claim was nonsense. Can we understand why he said that by looking at Pierre Bonnard, a man whose life seems blessed or at least blessedly uneventful. The paintings he produced already seemed anachronistic to many besides Picasso in his day. They lack any trace of the cubist attempts to express the experience of brokenness that fascinated so many of his colleagues and friends. Perhaps that's the reason they produce so much pleasure. Nothing's broken in them. <laughs> the world is as it should be. It's the pleasure that makes them feel suspect. As an article in Picasso's House Journal put it when Bonnard died in 1947, quote, this reverence for Bonnard is shared only by people who know nothing about the grave difficulties of art and cling above all to what is facile and agreeable, end quote. This is from an art review, but uh, the uneasiness could go even further. We're inclined to suspect that Bonnard not only knew too little about the grave difficulties of art, but the difficulties of life itself. There's seats up here for anybody who wants them. Just look at his own life. Um, born in 1867, he lived his whole life in the land of his birth. 
uh, fell in love at 26 with a woman who became his model, and then his wife, and lived with her till death parted them. Bought one house in the south of France and eventually another where he could paint those flowering mimosas and sunlit interiors to his heart's content. Nice work if you can get it, but in the face of what we know about reality, is this anything more than an escape from it? It's an escape I've always been happy to indulge in, but one about which I felt slightly sheepish um, until I saw an exhibit mostly devoted to Rothko, which included a full, few small works by Bonnard, who Rothko studied intensely. Well, all right. Both of them understood the complexities of color. The interesting thing about this painting, unlike the others I've shown you, is it wasn't painted in um, Provence. It was painted in Normandy. Now, anybody's been to Normandy? <laughs> this is not what Normandy looks like, right? Um, so there was something within him that was um, looking at perceiving and able to produce a very different palette. Um, so both, of, both Rothko and Bonard understood the complexities of color. Still, it seemed hard to rhyme the sublime canvases of Rothko, dark and brooding even when the colors are dazzling, with the hymns to everyday bliss that Bonard spent his life producing. Rothko, after all, said that all his work was born of violence. Now, I've come to think they have more in common than complexities of color. Though the great abstract expressionist Rothko is taken more seriously today than the hard to characterize Bonnard, both artists are struggling with transcendence, just the category Amari sought and failed to find that evening in Auschwitz. Beauty, thus seen, is a form of resistance, an attempt to remind us of the ideas that oppose relations of power and violence. Those relations were so all-encompassing at Auschwitz that they overcame every attempt to recall their opposites. Um, the only thing that um, uh, had any power to oppose them um, by that point was the Red Army. That's that. It's dangerous to try to speak for the dead, especially one who wrote, as Amari did, that every attempt to discuss, to discuss Auschwitz by one who wasn't there is like a blind man's attempt to understand color. Yet Amari, after the liberation, turned his attention to the radiance of the ordinary that was Bonnard's life subject. It speaks for our zeitgeist that the works of Amari that have been translated are his very darkest books about Auschwitz, aging, suicide. Uh, the other sides of his fairly large opus are only available in German. Yet his sharpest scorn was reserved for those professional pessimists who, he said, are terrified of banality. His compassion for the ordinary reached its peak in his last book, Charles Bovary Landarzt, a retelling of Madame Bovary from the perspective Perspective of Emma's unprepossessing husband, which I urge you all to read if you haven't. In Amory's version, the country doctor rails against his creator, Flaubert, for denying him the right to sensuality and passion reserved for Emma's lovers. By restricting those rights to the elite, Flaubert, says Amory, betrayed the principles of the French Revolution, which insisted on the dignity of the ordinary. The truths that Amory expressed about Auschwitz are very far from the world Bonnard gave us, but the truths in his later work are not. In a wonderful essay, Jed Pearl described Bonnard's late paintings as, I quote, blossoms at the peak of their beauty. And because there's a strong element of improvisation and risk involved in this technique, we are constantly reminded that beauty is unreliable that blossoms will decay, that ripe fruit will rot, that the bright afternoon sun will fade to darkest night. No other, offer, no other artist offers such complicated bliss." End quote. It's the risk, in fact, and the sense of uncertainty in his technique that drew Picasso's ire. Uh, he called it a potpourri of indecision. 
his t technique. Unlike Picasso, Bonnard painted the world as it should be, without forgetting that the moments when it is that way will rarely last for long. That's what gives its work, its, his work, its dazzling power, keeping it dancing on the edge of kitsch without ever succumbing to it. Kitsch asks no questions, admits no doubt, no contradiction. Am I suggesting that truth and beauty in the persons of my two heroes are closer than they seem because Amory is brighter and Bonnard darker than each will originally seem? In part, I am. Like any great modern, each acknowledged that the tension between the is and the ought cannot be overcome, but only kept in tenuous balance. This lends an undercurrent of sadness to any experience of great beauty, which may be the reason we've come to fear it. It may be the only thing that Plato and Nietzsche have in common. Both of them thought that joy demands eternity. Very different ways, of course. That's a line from Nietzsche. Those will, uh, some of you will know it. Um, but it's um, surprisingly not far from the Platonic view that it's not really there unless it's eternal. Accepting that we're human means accepting evanescence. Things needn't be eternal in order to matter. People who've come close to death often express it. The experience that you're mortal makes you feel more alive. Whether or not they brush death, it's perfectly clear that some people are more alive than others, whether or not they're happier. As a rule, they usually aren't. Earlier times may not have understood it any better than we do, but they weren't embarrassed to name it. The life force, or spark, as my friend David Shulman would put it, thought close to the divine. It's not. Instead, it's something that makes those who have it fully human and those who don't look like sleepwalkers. Those who have it can find meaning and beauty in scrap iron or tomatoes. They can make prose lyric and poetry transcend. It isn't enough to make someone heroic, but without it, any hero will be forgotten. Rousseau called it force of soul. Arendt called it love of the world. It's the foundation of eros. You may call it charisma. Is it a gift of the gods or something that has to be earned? Watching such people, you will sense that it's both. Given like perfect pitch or grace that no one can deserve or strive for, and captured like the greatest of prizes it is. Having it makes people think more, see more, feel more. More intensely, more keenly, more loudly if you like, but not more in the way of power except for the ways in which that prize is a power of its own. Attempts to describe this quality in prose inevitably sound like Nietzsche at best and Ayn Rand at worst. Only the arts can do it justice. The word vitality says too little, but I'll use it for lack of something better. When the arts manage to achieve it, they can, for the, a moment, help us to overcome our chains instead of decorate them. Some ways of life shine more, but only the arts can show that. When philosophers try to say it, we speak in platitudes, I fear. But philosophers can ask, we can't do, uh, show it as well as artists or poets or musicians can. Philosophers can ask the question, if this vitality looks like something granted by grace, how can we view it as central without succumbing to the worst forms of elitism? And I have an answer to that, right? I mean, if we acknowledge that some people have that quality of being more alive, um, they just do. Um, and um, many of you, the, the people in, in this room whom I know personally will know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but the question is, if you do hold that spark to be central, um, what's to present us all, prevent us all from becoming Nietzschean? And my answer to that question is, consider babies. Nearly every baby approaches nearly every bit of her surroundings with the intense vivacity that the most talented turn into art someday. 
It's a new world, after all, to be explored with the bold high spirits that put Columbus in the shade. Earlier ages might have called the babies awe and wonder religious. I believe it's the reason they exert such fascination on grown-ups, at least when they're not responsible for them 24-7. <laughs> Something in the way our world is structured destroys the ability to experience life that children, all children, express in the first two years of it. We have terrified them somehow, perhaps because they've seen how easily they can be sacrificed. Could the value of life simply be living this vividly, the value of the arts then helping us to do so? In the Jed Pearl essay I cited, he describes every stroke of Bonnard's color as life-giving. For even tragic art, as Nietzsche saw, views life as a gift despite our knowledge of its deep, even structural flaws. Living life in recognition that it is a gift, after all, is a form of gratitude for the fact that it's been bestowed upon us. The more often we can do this, the more meaning we will win. All the more so if our lives can contribute to uncovering and opposing those forces that deaden the lights in children's eyes. The power of beauty is transient as well as transcendent, but it isn't for all that less true. Thank you. Martin, do you want to, we figured, okay, we, we said we would discuss after each, or did we, no. we oh, okay, we decided differently, thank you. Then um, let me give the floor to Sandra Gilman, um, our um, founding uh, chairman of the board who has kindly come to celebrate our 25th anniversary with us today.